Hello, my name is John Sienho. I'm an immunologist from Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. I'd like to thank the organizers for including us in this oral abstract session. And today, I'd like to share with you our findings on the immunological characteristics of COVID-19 in people with HIV. I do not have conflict of interest to report. HIV infection is characterized by a chronic inflammatory state and varying degrees of immune dysfunction. This is even in the presence of suppressive antiretroviral therapy. COVID-19 is associated with perturbations in immune functions, most notably lymphopenia. Importantly, those with severe lymphopenia tend to have worse outcomes in the non-HIV population. Data on the immunological impact of SARS-CoV-2 co-infections in people living with HIV are currently limited. During March and April of 2020, New York City was one of the major epicenters of COVID-19. During this period, we conducted a retrospective study of people living with HIV, presenting to five New York City emergency departments and who tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 by nuclear acid amplification. Specifically, we evaluated the clinical and immunological outcomes of COVID-19 in this population. In total, 93 people with HIV had PCR-confirmed COVID-19 during the study period. The median age was 58, 24.7% were female, 3.2% were transgender, 42.9% were African-American, and 31.2% self-identified as Hispanic. In this cohort, the mean duration of HIV infection was 20 years, median previous CD4 T lymphocyte counts was 554 and 83.8% had recent plasma HIV-1 RNA measurements below 50 copies. 69.6% were on an antiretroviral therapy that included tenofovir. We compared lymphocyte and CD4 levels pre-COVID and during COVID, and found that at presentation, people living with HIV with COVID-19 demonstrated significant lymphopenia and decreased CD4 T cell counts when compared to their baseline the CD4 percentage was also reduced. We also found that the level of inflammatory markers, including C-reactive protein, fibrinogen, and D-dimer were commonly elevated. In the graphs here, the red lines represent the upper limits of normal for each test. And as you can see, all three markers are significantly elevated in most subjects. Serum cytokine profile panels, which included interleukin-6, IL-8, TNF-alpha, and L1-beta were obtained at the discretion of treating physicians. We found that the serum cytokine profiles during acute COVID-19 in people living with HIV were characterized by elevated interleukin-6, IL-8, and TNF-alpha, but not IL-1-beta. The red line here again represents upper limits of normal for each test. Close to 100% of patients had drastically elevated peak IL-6 and IL-8 levels during the course of COVID-19 infections. We next compare the immune response during COVID-19 between patients with HIV who died and those who recovered. Of the 93 patients who presented to the emergency room during the study period, 72, per, 72 were admitted. Out of these patients, 26% died and 73% recovered. Notably, those who died had significantly lower nadir absolute lymphocyte counts during COVID-19 compared to those with who recovered. Panel C here showed that this difference remained significant at the time of discharge or death. We did not find significant differences in presenting CD4 T cell count between the two groups. This finding is consistent with the data from the non-HIV population. Looking at inflammatory markers and cytokine profiles, we found that CRP, IL-6, and IL-8 were significantly higher among subset of those who died compared to those who recovered. Similarly, fibrinogen and D-dimer were also tend to be higher in those who died compared to those who recovered, but this did not reach significance. We did not observe difference in age, sex, BMI, duration of HIV infection, neither preceding or presenting CD4 T cell count, or viral suppression preceding or during the COVID-19 presentation between those who died and those who recovered. 
This study has some limitations. First, this was a retrospective chart review study. As such, the immune tests were obtained at the discretion of treating physicians and not obtained for all subjects. Second, we did not have a match HIV negative comparison group. Third, high rates of HIV suppression in the cohort prevented us from drawing conclusions about the risk of severe COVID-19 in viremic people living with HIV. Fourth, it should be noted that testing was limited in New York City and biased toward, toward secret patients during the study period. Lastly, data on race and ethnicity were limited. In summary, we found that people living with HIV who died of COVID-19 had significantly higher levels of cell markers or immune activation and inflammation, and more severe lymphopenia than those who survived. We found that a subset of people living with HIV are capable of mounting profound inflammatory responses that have been noted to correlate with poor outcomes in people without HIV. These findings raise concerns that people living with HIV remain at risk for severe manifestations of COVID-19 despite antiretroviral therapy, and that prominent immune dysregulation in a subset of people living with HIV during infection is associated with worse, worse outcomes. Further studies are warranted to determine whether inflammatory pathways are exacerbated or potentiated in some people living with HIV compared with the general population. I'd like to thank Dr. Michael Peluso, who contributed equally to this effort. Also, our emergency medicine colleague, Dr. Colton Margus, who helped us capture this cohort, as well as our ID colleagues who care for the patients and provided critical reviews.